Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk the, about COIL and the attention economy. Um, obviously, I'm used to giving talks in front of a live audience, so this is a bit of an adjustment. Um, but there are some perks as well, so there will be a live chat, I understand. So if, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in there, um, and I'll actually be able to answer them during the talk, um, or at least I'll try to. Um, so hopefully, I'll make it a little bit more interactive, and if you have any questions, just you can get them right off your chest immediately. Um, and with that, let's jump right into the talk, and I hope you enjoy it. So first of all, my name is Stefan Thomas. Um, I'm a web developer. Um, more recently, I've been the founder and CEO of Coil. And um, what, what is Coil? Coil is a company that um, is essentially focused on uh, enabling uh, open standards for micropayments on the web. Um, so we're, we're trying to be sort of the first provider for open micropayments. Um, with the goal that other companies will jump in in the future and also become providers and, and compete with us and, and kind of make this a very dynamic marketplace. Um, and it's a bit of a passion project, but it's also something that I, I really believe is needed. Um, and we'll get a little bit into the reasons uh, for that later in the talk. Uh, but before we jump in, I, I kind of want to uh, first talk about the term micropayment. Like, what does that actually mean? So when you think about the term micropayment, um, I looked it up in Wiktionary, and the Wiktionary said it's a, a financial transaction for a very small amount of money. Now, if you think about it, the term very small is actually pretty vague. It doesn't really say like, well, how much is very small? And so it might be worth talking about that for a second. Um, so when you kind of think about it, like look around on the internet, there's a couple different opinions of what people uh, think is a micropayment. Um, one that I particularly like was PayPal's definition is kind of anything under $12. I think most people from the credit card world would probably put their, um, would probably put their estimates somewhere in that range. Um, and so I think it's a pretty good uh, number to go with um, if you just want a sort of a starting point. However, just to give you an idea of how wide the range is, um, there was a conversation that I had at my previous job over at Ripple and uh, I was talking to one of our bank customers about micropayments, and I realized that we were sort of talking past each other a little bit. And I asked them, you know, what do you actually consider a micropayment? And they said, well, we have a definition for micropayments, and for us, it's any payment under $10,000. So that's a quite a difference to PayPal um, on the one side. And actually, <laughs> there's another really big difference, which is if you look at what Coil is doing, um, our typical payment size is actually one hundredth of one cent. So it's actually a lot smaller than even PayPal's definition. If you look at that entire range, that's I think something like a hundred million times difference, uh, or ten million times difference. So that's a quite a lot, <laughs> quite a lot of ground to cover if you're just using one term, and and uh, you know all of this falls under that definition. So what we are talking about for the purposes of this talk, call, sorry for for this talk, is more on the right hand side of the screen. So the very very small micropayments. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about why those aren't more prevalent. Like, why don't we see micropayments being made everywhere? Why don't we see them like incorporated into a lot of you know business processes or just in our day-to-day -day lives? Um, and there's a couple of very good reasons for that. So um, the first one is there's a prohibitive processing cost today. So if you try to do micropayments over typical uh, payment systems like credit cards, um, you know, even as if you're doing something as large as a dollar. Um, the cost starts to get quite significant. And you might have heard of what like typical credit card costs are, so in the two, three percent range. But when you're talking about micropayments, there's actually also a fixed cost that starts to be quite significant. So for a one dollar payment, the typical payment cost could be as much as 45 cents, which is a lot. Um, and so, you know, if your total payment is a dollar, 45 cents might be getting close to being prohibitively expensive. Um, now, there are some fee schedules um, that credit card companies or companies like PayPal have um, for micropayments specifically, but you're still looking at a couple of cents at a, at a minimum um, for, these, for these systems to even process those kinds of payments. Um, and so when we're talking about a hundredth of a cent, we really need to, uh, we really need like an entirely different kind of infrastructure to process that sort of payment. So what is the cost of, of a micropayment on, on Interledger? So if you send dollar over Interledger, like what's the cost of that? And that's where it gets really interesting because um, Interledger uh, works very differently from traditional payment systems. 
Um, and so the companies that are currently providing IntelliJ services, which is just a handful of companies, but they're actually not charging per payment at all. There's no fixed fee. There are costs involved in foreign exchange. So if you're going from one currency to another, you might get an exchange rate. And then if you went back the other way, you would find that you'd have a little bit less money. And that's because the companies build a little bit of a spread or, or fee into the exchange rate. Um, however, you know, if you're not changing um, across currencies, you will actually get pretty close to no fee at all. Um, and especially no fixed fee. Um, and the way that IntelliJ infrastructure is actually paid for is more on a capex basis. So you know, you, you buy the the pipes, you you know maybe pay a monthly fee for IntelliJ access, something like that. But you don't necessarily pay per payment. Um, and what that does is it really makes small payments. You know, it really favors very small payments. Um, now you might say like, okay, well, what if somebody just sends like an infinite number of payments and, and kind of tries to overwhelm the network? And that works very similarly to how the internet works where, you know, each link has sort of a capacity. Um, and so if you try to send too many uh, transactions, it just sort of, um, you know, rate limits and kind of limits that. Um, but you can always add more servers. And, and again, that goes back to the the capital expenditure. So if you add more servers and you spend a little bit more money, then you can also process more payments. Um, but again, like at the cost, even at a size as small as of, of like a, a hundredth of a cent, um, the cost is actually pretty negligible um, because server hardware is just so fast these days that the incremental cost to process a little bit of data is, is really not that much. Um, so that's, that's, that's one big barrier dealt with. Um, but I'm kind of working my way up to the harder and harder problems here. So the next problem that we have to look at is the mental cost of payments. So you can make the processing as cheap as you want, and that's great. However, if you're asking users to make purchase decisions all the time, there's actually a non-zero cost involved. Like we don't think about this when we're buying a TV because the mental overhead of thinking about the price is, is pretty low compared to the cost of the TV. But when you're talking about paying like one cent or two cents or something like that, you know, asking a user to like click a button and approve that payment is actually quite significant. Um, and it might be more than the two cent that you're asking the user to pay. And that can cause a lot of problems because, you know, if the user has this additional cost, quote unquote, um, sort of a psychic cost, um, then they're less likely to do it and they're less likely to repeat doing it. Um, and so it can also get just annoying if you're constantly having to approve these payments. And there's a really good article about this from Nick Sabo, um, where he talks about this problem and, and how, how it could be addressed. And it, it's sort of a, you know, this is kind of a vague point, but um, I found that like whenever you go to a really small scale, um, things get a little bit weird because some of these like transaction costs or weird rounding errors and things like that that you were able to ignore before when you go to very small amounts and very small sizes, uh, things get kind of strange. So you can almost think about this like quantum mechanics where, you know, once you go to very small scales, the laws of nature change a little bit. Um, and I'll give you a bit of an example of this mental cost that I'm talking about. Um, I used to uh, use a service called Flatter, and it's it's still around, very successful um, uh, service. And you know, I really enjoyed using it, but only for a while. And then I kind of, you know, I just didn't have the discipline to stick with it. So the way it works is you pay them a, a monthly uh, fee, and then as you're browsing the web, there's these Flatter buttons, and you kind of click them to support different creators, or at least that's how it used to work. Um, but then the problem is like, if you're asking users to do all these interactions, you know, that gets very, um, yeah, annoying or, or, or distracting and it's not very convenient for the user. And so, um, in my case, as a user, I kind of stopped doing it after a while. Um, and you know, the flatter guys are really smart. And so they actually recognize this, um, and they launched a, a new version as already like several years ago, but, um, they launched a new version called flatter 2.0. And this is a quote from the announcement blog post, and, and they're sort of talking about how um, it really has to be automated. Um, and that's, in my opinion, the right way to solve this mental cost problem is you have to find ways, as scary as that sounds, but like you have to find ways to, to automate the, um, the payment so that the user doesn't have to think about it at all. Um, and I think that creates like an interesting market for companies like Coil to come in and say, or Coil or Flatter or others, um, to come in and say, you know, we're going to get really good at making those decisions on your behalf. 
And if you, if you don't think we're doing a good job, you can go to one of our competitors, but we're going to compete on trying to do it the way that you would do it um, or make the decisions that you would make if you had the time and the energy to think about it all the time, right? Um, so that's kind of an interesting um, problem and, and something you have to solve if you really want to go after micropayments. Um, another problem is, um, well, the use case, you know, if, if, you, if you're buying something online, well, you know, chances are you're purchasing something that is a little bit more valuable than a hundredth of a cent. I mean, even if it's just something like the shipping costs would become prohibitive if you're buying something physical. So you're already kind of limiting it to like digital goods. Um, but even then, again, we talked about sort of the need for automation. Um, and so it starts to look quite different than the payment processes of, of yesterday, right? It's not that we're talking about, when we're talking about micropayments, it's not just that we're talking about smaller payments. It's that we're talking about, you know, financial interactions that look very different than um, the financial interactions that you might ordinarily think about. Like I go somewhere, I pay you for something, and then I get something in return. That's that's quite um, that's quite of a traditional model to a traditional way to think about it, and probably not appropriate for micropayments. Um, so, I kind of compare this sometimes to the internet, right? Like if I was describing the internet to you, I probably wouldn't describe it as like a cheaper, faster way to send faxes. Although that would be true. I mean, I think the internet is a cheaper, faster way to send documents uh, compared to a fax machine. Um, but really what most people would probably focus on if they were explaining the internet was the, the use cases that a fax machine just can't do at all. And um, these are things like social networks and, and file sharing and all kinds of other things that have come up. And so um, this is really, you know, showing that when you lower the transaction costs of communication, it's not that you're just lowering costs and increasing the speed, but you're actually enabling new use cases. That's an important thing to remember. So when I talk about these new use cases, that's obviously very abstract. So what do I mean by that? And like, what could some of those new use cases be? Um, so I'll give you a quick example from the world of content, which is kind of the, the use case that we're focused on at Coil. So today, if you want to uh, release content, you might put it on a content platform. I've, I've tried to find like a really nice neutral icon that's not really judgmental uh, about content platforms. And so you might upload your content to this large platform um, and distribute it to users. Um, and it's not like there's only one platform available. There are alternative platforms that you could use. Um, but usually in, in a lot of cases, there's one or two dominant platforms and then maybe like a couple smaller ones. And if you are a creator that's sort of trying to decide between like which platform to go with, um, it's not really an, an even comparison. Um, it's, it's not like you're picking this digital camera versus that digital camera and, and which one do you want to use to record your videos. It's more like, you know, there's a, there's a strong reason to go with the bigger platform. And that reason is very simply the audience. Um, a bigger platform is going to have a bigger audience. And so, um, you know, for most, for most creators will choose the bigger platform. And then of course, on the user side, it's the exact same story where, you know, if I want to watch content, I'm probably going to go to the platform that has the most content available because ultimately the content is what I'm there for. Um, and so one big reason why this is kind of what has happened and, and how this industry has evolved is because it's, it would be very inefficient if users, you know, paid um, each creator individually. Like if you just imagine, like if you had to sign up to every single creator individually, I mean, it kind of works on Patre uh, Patreon, but you're only able to really subscribe to a small number of creators on Patreon. Whereas like if you're consuming content, you probably consume content from dozens, if not hundreds of creators per month. If you think about all the articles, photos, videos, and other things that you look at over the course of a whole month. Um, and so, you know, that just wouldn't really work if, if, if you had to make a credit card payment or something like that for everybody. And so what the platforms really do is they act as sort of aggregators. So they aggregate a lot of users together. They aggregate a lot of advertisers together. They aggregate a lot of content together. Um, and that way they take a lot of the transaction costs out of the system. However, in that process, as I was mentioning before, um, they also take a lot of the competition out of the system. So um, once there is a big platform, that platform has a huge advantage and it's really, really hard to try to unseat that. Um, and so when you have micropayments available, it's not just that 
you know, platforms might be able to charge, you know, in smaller increments or something like that. It's more that we can actually get rid of platforms entirely, or at least restructure the market to be a lot more competitive. So if you're looking at it from the perspective of a creator, I might now be able to put my content out there on a lot of different platforms and still get paid back. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting because the distribution side of the equation already exists, right? There's BitTorrent, there's all these different networks where I could be putting out content in a distributed fashion. And there's even like really nice user interfaces like Popcorn Time where you can watch that content. But the big, big problem and the glaring omission there is that the creator has no way to monetize that. There's very, or it's very, very hard to monetize at least. Um, how do you get that, how do you get some money back for um, the content that you're putting out into these networks? Um, and so if you have a protocol like Intelligy and you have very efficient micropayments, you can, you can build something that um, sends money back to the creator. Um, and, you know, obviously you have to design and think about these products very carefully. You have to think about, you know, do you use some kind of digital rights management to enforce the payment or is it more like a tip or a donation? And you just hope that, and, you know, because you lower the friction so much for users to support the creators, they will do so. Um, that's a little bit tricky, but... Um, in principle, right, it, it's once you have micropayments available, it at least opens the door to building these open systems, open distribution channels, while still enabling monetization, which is just not something that's really possible without micropayments. However, there's another barrier, um, and this is something that, uh, this one I actually didn't really think about uh, when we started the company. Oops. Um, but once we started, we kind of quickly realized that when you're dealing with very small payments, well, it takes a lot of them to make a significant amount of money. And so a lot of our creators um, have very quickly come back to us and said like, yeah, I enabled my website with web monetization, but I only made a few cents. And um, I think for now that's okay because we're mostly just um, trying to establish the technology and trying to figure out how it would work. Um, but you have to kind of think about like, how do we actually get people to a place where they can actually live off of this? Um, there was one particular creator um, who web monetized her blog. Um, I don't know if I should call her out by name, but I'll just sort of relay the story. Um, and she said that she made a, a you know a few cents off of it, um, but um, she was still very excited because that's more than the total amount of money that she made over the you know ten plus years that the site was online because she never wanted to put ads on it. Um, and I thought that was sort of a nice way to think about what we're, the stage that web monetization and, and this technology is at right now. But how do we get past that? How do we get to a place where creators can actually live off of that revenue? And so if you think about the problem, it's like, well, you have got users who are paying and so they have really high expectations. Um, but then on the other hand, you've got creators who don't have a ton of time and resources to make exclusive content just to make a few extra cents. Um, and so we've thought about that problem a lot at Coil. And I think what we're, what we're sort of getting to is um, we have to engage these early adopters um, and, and kind of take some inspiration from, from companies like Patreon, where there is sort of more of a direct relationship between the creator and the fan, um, and the fan becomes sort of a supporter. Um, and th in that kind of context, um, monetization can actually be fun. So I was watching some YouTube videos where, um, you know, uh, streamers would go to other streamers on Twitch and they would just donate money to those other streamers. Usually it would be like a more popular streamer going to donate to a less popular one. Um, or like one that, that hasn't got as big of an audience yet, I should say. Um, and it's really interesting to watch that dynamic because it's not just that you're donating and it's very transactional, like you're donating and you get some content in return, but you don't get really any content or anything tangible, but what you get is the reaction from the creator who's very grateful and says like, thank you for supporting me. Um, and that's, that's entertainment. That is, um, that's fun. That's, uh, you know, a, a fun thing to do. Um, and so if you think about different forms of micropayment and how widely they've been adopted and, and sort of how big of a deal they are, you can actually draw a bit of a correlation between how engaging those forms of micropayments are versus how popular they are. And obviously, this is not very scientific, but sort of directionally, you know, I think, you know, PayPal has a micropayment service and, and um, I think Visa uh, launched one a while ago. Um, and they've not really made huge waves as far as I can tell. Um, and I think it's because these are kind of payments companies and their, their, their view on payments is that you click a button and we process the payment and we're very reliable and serious and clear cut and all this kind of stuff. 
Um, and that's not very conducive for micropayments where you really want that sort of engagement and a payment needs to be fun um, and not something interesting needs to happen. And so when you go more into the world of like live streaming, like on Twitch, where I donate and then I get a live reaction from the streamers, like, thank you, Stefan, this is awesome. This helps so much. Um, you know, this kind of thing, it's very different. It's a very different experience. And so if we want to micro monetize the web, um, we have to have that sort of engaging experience. And you might say, well, well, how do you do that without live streaming? But there's already a lot of interesting ideas that we've seen uh, people in the community experiment with. So for example, uh, one of the larger sites that's web monetized, Imager, um, they rolled out a feature called Accolades, which allows you to um, you know, upvote uh, posts uh, with a special upvote called an Accolade um, that you can only do if you're paying a supporter. And um, when you do that, there's a little bit of an animation and some cool stuff happens. And so that gives you that immediate kind of reward of like, yeah, I'm doing something good. And there's something that um, exclusive that only I get to experience because I'm, I'm supporting the, the site. Um, and so we want to explore that a lot more. And we hope that the community will explore that a lot more um, and, and how to make that uh, payments more engaging. And we think that that kind of you know, value add for the user um, can get us over that initial scaling hump. So, you know, this is kind of as much time as I have, and um, I hope some of these thoughts were, were interesting for you. Um, if you want to get involved with web monetization or the stuff that Coil is doing, um, you can go head over to developers.coil.com. There's a bunch of resources, links, um, links to uh, people who have already monetized their blogs, um, you know, tutorials, videos, open source projects, all kinds of stuff um, you can find there. Um, there's also um, a grant. So Coil has given a, a $100 million grant to try to get this technology started. Again, it's trying to help um, you know, that scale problem. How do we get this off the ground initially? And so if you're interested to learn more about that, the, the first round of grantees has been announced and it's a, it's a long list, um, but super fun to read through and kind of look at all the different projects people are thinking about doing with this technology. So if you want to know more about that, head on over to grantfortheweb.org um, and you can find out all about that. Um, the, the grant is, is, is being done in collaboration with uh, Mozilla and Creative Commons. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff there um, to discover as well. And then finally, last plug, I promise, um, if you want to kind of stay in touch and, and follow um, what we're doing, uh, probably the best way is to follow me personally, uh, Just Moon on Twitter, um, as well as the company, which is just Actoil on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed my talk and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. And uh, yeah, if you have any more questions, please feel free to drop them down in the chat. And uh, I'm excited to hear some of the other speakers. And yeah, thanks for joining. That's it. Bye.